the flipkart board had a decision to make uh, whether to keep such in or to not keep such in and that again is just you know such a pretty shocking thing it it was so dramatic that the sale was almost called off because of this the way uh, the 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 negotiations were conducted at the end um what went down between sachin and dini i mean i was like i knew some of these details because i had reported on it a lot of people in the start of ecosystem at that point in time actually thought that snap deal would um, emerge as the real winner in the e-commerce the cards valuation was more than the valuation of all other internet stores put together bini was actually shaking just before he had to tell sachin um, so it's details like these you know that just kind of were very very surprising ladies and gentlemen boys and girls welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast today we have with us mehi dalal mehi dalal is a respected journalist in the business community and is the author of the famous and the best selling book the big billion startup so a lot of things to learn from mehi today especially about his book writing journey so thank you so much for joining me on the podcast mehi it's a pleasure to host you thank you for taking out time from your busy schedule uh thanks for it it's, it's great to be here yeah so so mehir uh, i think uh, writing a book is is kind of becoming quite uh, popular and nobody uh, is better than you to sort of spill the beans on how the process looks like and how does somebody is able to write something which turns out and becomes a best seller uh so on on the behalf of my audience and myself as well i just wanted to uh, know a couple of things from you about your entire book writing journey uh so i think the first question which uh, i had in my mind was that uh, how did the idea of book writing came to you was it something that uh, you had in your mind like couple of years or maybe if you can sort of talk about the origin of the idea itself Yeah yeah sure so um i i started writing on startups in 2014 um, and uh, you know as as you will remember um, before 2014 the startup scene in india was really really um, you know there had been a lot of yeah, uh, yeah. ups and downs um and uh, i, I there, there was there was pretty decent um uh, interest in uh, indian startups um uh in i i think about a year or two before the great recession of 2008 but after that you know it just um for the next two years um kind of like yeah there was almost no funding happening for tech startups uh, for two years and yeah, then again yeah, there was yeah. a mini funding boom in 2011 uh, 12 uh, 2011 and then again from uh, i think 2012 to 2014 it was I mean, it was a it was a proper funding winter, so um, there was very little um, belief among um, people in general and even at media houses, um, you know, that this startup thing was for real before 2014. So there was not uh, there there weren't a lot of people who were writing on startups. Um, there weren't a lot of newspaper editors who were really properly interested in startups until 2014, and then it just suddenly changed, right? So um i mean india really experiences its first big funding boom in 2014 15 and i think interest started yeah, yeah. um rising and also it was sustained uh, after that um in covering startups because then um you know people who most people in urban india uh, or at least in the metros you know started using these internet services um in one form or Another, I mean, everyone could see yeah, that this time, yeah, okay, yeah. it's it's for real. You know, it's not going away. Um, so all this uh, translated into a lot of interest um, in knowing more about startups, um, not just um, uh, interest from newspapers, but also interest from publishers. So I was actually first approached to do a book on Flipkart way back in 2015. Um, I had only been writing okay. on Flipkart for about a year. And at that time, okay. you know, I I considered it, but I was just not sure if I could do the book first of all, and also, you know, if it was really the right time to do a book on Flipkart because it was um, it was so early in, in its own journey. Yeah, um, Amazon was yeah. um, on the rise, so it was just not clear, you know, where this would end up. Um, and a lot of people 
in the startup ecosystem at that point in time actually thought that Snapdeal would um, emerge as um, the real winner in the e-commerce battle, which looks, which seems completely absurd now. But I mean, that is what a lot of people actually believed in the startup uh, ecosystem. So I, okay. I did not choose to do yeah. the the book uh, in 2015, um, and then 20 like I continue to cover Flipkart. Um, I think everyone knows, you know, it, it, there were a lot of ups and downs uh, in its battle with Amazon in those years from 2015 to 2018. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. finally the story culminated. I mean, at least the story of Flipkart as an independent startup culminated in um, uh, 2018 um, and ended in 2018. So um, it seemed like, you know, this was the time to do a book because I had already been covering Flipkart for four years by then. Um, I had also been writing on other internet startups, but Flipkart was really the focus of my coverage because it was really the too big to fail startup in India, right? Like if Flipkart had failed, you know, the startup scene itself would have taken a, a massive hit, um, would have been set yeah, back by yeah. many years. Um, so that was like how important Flipkart was. I mean, I, I remember one, at one point, I, I don't know exactly when it was in 2014 or 2015, but Flipkart's valuation was more than the valuation of all other internet startups put together. So yeah, yeah, it also yeah, raised yeah, way more money yeah. than all the other startups put together. So it was just so important. Um, um, a company in the startup scene. Uh, so, and obviously, I mean, I think a lot of your uh, viewers would know that, uh, it was also a company that had a lot of internal drama. So in every which way it made for a fascinating and compelling story. And it was also a story that hadn't been told from start to finish, um, by anyone. Um, and I, I don't mean, um, in, um, you know, a lot of details because, um, I mean, the, the form of, uh, newspapers or journalism doesn't allow you to do that. But even a lot of, um, the main people who were responsible for Flipkart's rise were not really well known. You know, their personalities were not known. The dynamics between them and the founders and the investors were not known. So, like, you know, it was it was not only a great story, but it was also a story that hadn't been told properly at all. So, yeah, so it just made for um, yeah, yeah. a very obvious candidate uh, for a book. Got it. Got it. So 2018 is when you're saying that you started. Uh, so basically, you, you picked this task of writing on the Flipkart story. So how was how was the process looking like, Mihir? Uh, so from start to finish, uh, I think as as an author, uh, if you have to sort of distill down on the process, uh, would be great if you can sort of talk step by step on uh, how it went from initial idea to let's say the first draft, second draft, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So when I started working on the book, um, you know, I, I was actually supposed to work on the book with um, a colleague of mine, but um, I mean, but she had to drop out because uh, she had uh, family commitments. Um, so that was a bit of a, uh, um, uh, I mean, that was a bit of a um, worrying thing for me because I wasn't sure if I could do it by myself. Um, and when I started working on the book, um, the the ambition was really fairly limited. Like um, it wasn't as if I set out to write a really um, uh, like I, I didn't really set out to write in such uh, great detail about um, the characters involved um, in the book uh, at Flipkart. Um, and I think um, the more uh, I reported, uh, the more I felt like, you know, th I don't want to make this into a conventional business book about, you know, sales increasing, whatever, 200% in one year, then increasing to 50% then dropping back to like 150% or whatever, right? Because, I mean, that is not really what made Flipkart successful. I mean, there, there was a lot of um, uh, other stuff that was going on that was really interesting. Um, and yeah, so I started reporting um, in August of 2018, uh, just exclusively on the book. Um, and obviously, I was helped by the fact that I had written on Flipkart for four years before that. So I knew most of the people 
um, who were at the company uh, and who had been um, the major figures at the company. Um, and um, so I focused um, only on reporting for the first um, four to six months. Um, I did about, I think, um, in those six months itself, I would have done more than 200 interviews just for the book. Um, and, and this is all apart from like the four years um, of reporting that I had done on Flipkart. Um, so I gathered a lot of information in the first, um, you know, six to seven months. Um, and then I think I should talk a bit about the pitching process because uh, pitching the book is also yeah. very, very important, right? So, um, so mm-hmm. as soon mm-hmm. as the Flipkart sale happened to Walmart um, in May of 2018, um, you know, within a few weeks of that, uh, I was approached by publishers um, and other people were approached by publishers as well for a book on Flipkart because like I said, you know, it was just su- okay. such a compelling candidate for a book. Um, and then, um, finally, yeah, I yeah. think within, um, uh, within a couple of months, you know, most other people who were considering working on uh, a flip card book kind of decided to drop off, uh, because of whatever reasons I, I'm not really sure. Um, and then, um, uh, when I started pitching, um, um, I, I signed up with an agent, uh, because I was, told by uh, people I know uh, in the books business that it's it's just better to work through an agent, um, you know, whether it comes to negotiations with publishers or uh, whether it comes to, um, you know, dealing with publishers uh, as far as promoting your book is concerned. It's just better to have an agent because they, they work with publishers all the time. So they know how this process works inside out. Um, and um, yeah, ahead. so we had, um, we had interest from, I think about six publishers, right? Like all the major publishers in India okay. were interested in the book. Um, and we actually decided okay. so that like we conducted an auction and we decided to stop, um, the, the, the price from uh, rising because, because it was getting, it was getting to a level where, you know, we were just not sure if the money that they were investing in the book, which was basically like the, the advance that was being given to me would ever be recovered, right? Because, yeah. um, I mean, mm. it, it kind of became like the, this prestige thing because, you know, like there are very, very few, uh, serious business books in India. And, um, this was clearly going to be one because it was on Flipkart and it was being written by someone, you know, who had been writing on the company for many years. Um, yeah. So, yeah. um, so we actually had to stop the the auction uh because the 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 advance was get was rising to a level which we did not think you know we would be able to like justify it. um and um, we chose like i chose uh the the publisher uh, that i wanted to work with primarily based on um you know the editor that was involved in the pitching process because um because i wanted the book to be um more than a business book, um, you know, I did not, like, I chose um, the editor who I thought had the best uh, sort of uh, literary, um, uh, you know, abilities uh, rather than just going after money. So I think that was, that turned out to be one of the best decisions that I had taken with regards to the book because um, the editing makes a huge, huge difference, um, right? Like from being like a decent book to, a high quality book, it like the editing makes all the difference. Um, so, so yeah, so that was like super, super important. Um, choice was more based on who can help you more with the editing side than whoever sort of pays the highest amount of money. Correct. And also editing in a certain way, like, um, I did not want this to be a dry book, um, like a dry business book. So I wanted it to be a more interesting book that could be read even by a lay reader, right? Like who doesn't know anything about startups. So I thought it's best to actually go with an editor who doesn't do business books. Um, So the editor that I chose, she actually hadn't done business books before uh, that. Um, Whereas, you know, a lot of other editors that were involved in the auction, they were business editors, right? So um, I made, like, I took the, uh, like I made the choice of going with, a non-business uh, editor, uh, so that turned out to be very, very um, helpful for me. Um, yeah, so that is what I meant um, about like kind of going with um, 
like you're choosing an editor. And you're con- you you were considering any book as a bench benchmark when you were drafting this uh, book or thinking about this book? Um. So I um I I did uh initially, but I kind of quickly decided to um you know not uh take any book as a benchmark. Like obviously, you know, uh, Brad Stone's um Everything Store was um uh, initially um like the benchmark or something like what I wanted to do. But then very, very soon I kind yeah, of decided yeah. that I didn't because um, that book, you know, was writing about Amazon um, after many, many decades of um, uh, of, this, of, yeah, of there being yeah. a Silicon Valley and of, of the f- yeah. there being many, many books on Silicon Valley, right? Whereas there was nothing in yeah, India yeah. that uh, could, uh, could yeah. explain startups. Um, so I wanted it to yeah. be um a good introduction as well to like the startup world and to the post liberalization uh, kind of you know tech boom in india so that's why i i chose not to really um uh, go with any benchmark as such got it got it and in, and when you were thinking about it spending time doing all this work with the agent did you did you had like a slightest idea this is this is going to become a bestseller someday no, we really didn't. I mean, um, you know, like I said, we actually stopped the auction process because uh, I mean, the advance was getting to a level that, that we did not think was justified or could be justified by the commercial potential. Um, and um, yeah, so we did not think at all that this could be a bestseller. Um, we were just hoping that, you know, it gets promoted well, it gets reviewed and then um, yeah, I mean that that was basically the the aim that to just like put it out there so that you know people at least know that such a book existed. Got it, got it. So so you're saying the first step is basically figuring out the publisher, right? So with the help of agent, you figure out a publisher. The second step is where you're saying you did a lot of research for like six seven months. You did hundreds of interviews to get data while you were writing on that piece for like so many years. Uh, Correct. So. Uh, when when you're doing the second piece, which is the, uh, and you already had like a timeline in mind to, let's say you have to get this out by whatever, like eight, 10 months, 12 months is, was there a timeline in your head right in the beginning? Itself? Sort of, sort of. So we wanted okay. to uh, release the book uh, during big billion days, of course, uh, of 2019. Okay. So that, that was okay. a very convenient um, and, um, uh, you know, kind of obvious yeah, um, yeah, needed sense. to release the book. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you are doing, uh, when you're doing this so much of heavy research, right? So, was it like, uh, I mean, in terms of let's say number of hours that you are spending every day, was it like eight, ten hours every day? I mean, you are doing with your full time job, or is it like Correct. something yeah. uh, that you? I just... was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the from so uh, I think from. August to December, I was, uh, doing this alongside my job. So like, yeah, so those four, five okay. months were just like terrible because I was working 17, 18 hours on a regular basis and, you know, seven days a week. And, um, I also had a very, very stressful job at that time because, um, okay. uh, I mean, startup news just wasn't like, it was very, very intense. It was very heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I was working, uh, 17, 18 hours regularly and at least, you know, eight to nine hours uh, wow. on just the book. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, how are you navigating those times? I think, and, and, and that continued for like how long? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I thought, you know, because initially, like I did not, like my ambition for the book was not as expansive as it turned out to be. I thought, you know, I'd be able to finish it in six to eight months. Um, at least like, okay. you know, most of the work. Um, so I thought, you know, yeah, this, like this kind of like hellish, uh, uh, work, um, will just like last for whatever, four to five months and then it'll ease off okay. as I finish more and more work. But it just like the work just kept increasing and increasing and increasing because the material that I was gathering was so interesting that, um, you know, like I just did not want to stop. So, um, from August to December, I was working on this along with my job. And then I just decided that to do justice to the book, I need to work on it full time. So I think pretty much from December to, um, June or July of next year, I was just working exclusively on the book. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, 
that is the only way I could have done justice to the book and also just kind of, you know, survive because there's no way you can work 17, 18 hours, seven days a week for like that long. At yeah. least I could. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah um, that, so in December, so, I just decided to work on the so book. The narrative- time. Got it. Got it. So the final, let's say, whatever the final story that you came out with, uh, was it something that you had right in the beginning or it was something as you sort of gathered more and more data, more and more information, that picture started forming? Like, how was the process of getting from so much of research, data, insights, interviews to finally coming to the story? Yeah. So, I mean, so basically, you know, the period that I had been covering Flipkart, right, which is 2014 to 2018, by that time, Flipkart had already become a big company. Um, and my knowledge about yeah, yeah. Um, the pre-2014 period was obviously limited because um, with news, you know, you don't tend to look backward, like the, the focus is on the present and on the future. Um, so most yeah. of the, the work that I was doing um, from August to December was actually focused on that pre-2014 period, right? Like, so from, um, not just from Flipkart start, but even going back to like the, the early years of the Bunsells, like where did they grow up? You know, what was their IIT experience like? Um, what did they do after the IIT? Because a lot of like what Flipkart was about was actually determined by what the Bunsells were like at the IITs, at the IIT, uh, yeah. and at Amazon. So, like, I spent a lot of time just reporting and gathering information about that period. And that is what kind of, you know, just um, changed, like, what I wanted from the book and what I wanted the book to be. Because then it became a lot more ambitious. Like, you know, I delved fairly deep into their characters, into the characters of the people around them. Um, And I also looked very closely at, like, what helped Flipkart become the company that it did. Um, so I think that is, so once I started reporting on that early period of Flipkart and on the early years of the Bunsells, right? So after that is when, um, like, for me, the, uh, the book just changed. Uh, I mean, it was not like, um, I didn't know the broad contours of the story or what, you know, the Flipkart story was, but the details, you know, the, 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 the personalities, the characters, that, the detail into which I could go to, that changed completely after I started gathering information on that early period. So I think that was like really the key thing, um, you know, because um, Got it. I, I could have still written um, a fairly detailed book on Flipkart if I just focused, let's say, on the company itself. Uh, because, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, again, like there was so much drama, but it wouldn't have really been as rich like the, the 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 details wouldn't have been as rich as as they turned out to be uh, if i hadn't um, brought out um, you know the early Absolutely. years um, uh, of the bunsells and their iit experience and their amazon experience as well because all these things without these things you know there is no way they could have conceived of flipkart there's no way flipkart would have been as ambitious a company as it was um, so i think yeah that yeah, was yeah. Um, the main thing. Got it. Got it. So, so basically, what I understand now broadly is, uh, you spent like six, seven months on research, and another like six, six, seven months on refining the story into the final format, right? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So once um, I think, uh, yeah, I I spent about uh, so from August to December, I was almost just exclusively reporting. Um, then, uh, then from December to June. So I finished my first draft in June. Um, uh, I was doing a bit of reporting, uh, and a bit of writing. So it was a mix of reporting and writing and research, of course. Um, but yeah, like I just focused on reporting for about four to five months and then I started writing and then, um, also uh, the writing process, right? Like that is very important as well because, um, I'd never written a book before, and um, the the longest article that I had written was about four or five thousand words, uh, and the book is about twenty twenty five times that, right? So it takes a it takes a complete change in mindset to um, write a book, yeah. um, and I think again that is where um, my editor was just super super helpful. So I had finished. So what I did was, you know, I I wrote a few chapters, and then I got my editor's feedback um, on that. 
and okay um i think i was very very resistant initially to the kind of changes that she was suggesting but then like slowly you know the more and more i thought about it and the more i um uh, saw like what the changes that she was suggesting were doing to the story you know i just completely bought into that um approach and that just like really really helped me um to write in a focused way and in also a way that um is fitting for a book because the way you write for a book is very different from um journalism right like so for instance um just to give you a small example uh, when we write news articles you know we write what the information is and uh, or what the news is we write the context and then you know we quote Uh, the relevant people who are associated with the story um but that is not at all how a book works you know there is no um like you can't just have information context code like you need to have a story you need to have a narrative which means that you know you need to write in a way where like let's say if i'm writing about a character even if i have gathered information from that person uh, and if i'm using their quotes i cannot just write that x person said this i have to write it in a way that uh, kind of um, is very seamless in the story um, so what that means is that you know you have to use dialogues you have to use um, other forms that are fitting in um, for for a book and a for a narrative non fiction book as opposed to journalism so there are a lot of these small things you know that change from doing from writing journalism to writing a book um and yeah so that takes some time to understand to um to like actually make uh to actually work uh, because um like the first few times that you try it you know you will not really get the hang of it or at least you will not be able to fine tune it to uh, the level that is required um so that also took a lot of work like it took me about i think a couple of months um to to fine tune it properly and so i had to rewrite um uh, the chapters that i had written um and then again i had to rewrite a lot of the other uh, chapters based on this approach um yeah so the writing work was also super super intensive um so uh, you know so which is why mm-hmm. you just cannot do it uh, with something else like you need to just focus exclusively on on the book yeah yeah and i think one of also the uh, i understand important part of let's say book writing is also how you sort of market uh, market the book the marketing side of it right so what was what was the preparation around it uh, how were you thinking about it before the book release so that it is able to uh, reach to the maximum audience yeah i mean honestly you know over here um, uh, because um, it was the first time i was doing a book and also because this book was um on a pretty um strict timeline um i did not devote a lot of time or attention uh, towards thinking about marketing the book um and you know publishers are pretty well equipped to do that um but if i ever do a book again i will definitely spend more time um uh, thinking about you know marketing the book and also doing it in a more organized way honestly we got really lucky with the marketing of the book because it was very very widely reviewed um and this is one of um uh, those instances you know where the traditional channels of marketing work to be well like basically newspapers and that kind of media as opposed to social media um social media is obviously essential uh, but i did not have but the whole social media game at all in fact i had almost no social media game okay. which was um which is something i will change uh, the next time i do a book uh, but we got really lucky there was a lot of word of mouth um, around the book um so yeah so i think on the marketing side i got could it. have definitely done a better job my publisher did pretty got well it. because um you know they um uh, I mean, they have their own contacts. They have their own channels. Um, so it was very, very widely reviewed. Um, all the people, um, all the uh, relevant people at media houses uh, uh, were sent the book, were aware of the book, had read uh, 
the book mm-hmm. as well so that helped us got it so I, you're saying basic basically t- traditional media and a lot of reviews which sort of followed help in uh, the book getting some traction so given that Absolutely. you've gone through the entire journey of this this book writing meher what would be your uh, sort of advice to somebody who's aspiring to write a book uh, what are the few things that you have learned which you would like to share with people maybe 3 4 5 points which uh, they can probably implement to uh, to at least yeah. emulate what you have been able to achieve yeah so i think first of all you know it's very important to take it very seriously um because i think a lot of people um i mean there are just so many books out these days and a lot of books yeah. are very low quality honestly uh, you know yeah, so it's yeah. important to like take it seriously like you mm-hmm. have to devote i mean even if you don't even if you're not doing it full time you know don't just take don't just treat it as a side project or a hobby like you need to be very very serious about the book um secondly um i think it also helps if you ha- I mean, you don't need to have the most clear idea or the most definite idea about what the book is, but you need to have some kind of, um, you know, concrete idea as to what is your vision for the book, um, because that is where it becomes very important in terms of choosing the publisher, um, because you're not really choosing a publisher; you're choosing an editor at a publishing house, right? So you have to like, keep that in mind, and um, when you're choosing an editor. it is very important for your vision for the book to match their vision for the book because if you you know if your vision is x and that person's vision is completely different it's not going to work out it it'll just end up yeah being a very very bad experience because um you know books are not financially very lucrative so you're just like kind of doing it because you are very passionate about it right so and you don't want to especially in a situation like this you don't want to see your hard work being wasted so it is very important that the editor that you choose ends up having or has a similar vision to yours because if you have a similar vision then you can still work with each other you can still kind of you know work through differences but if the visions are not at least you know somewhat similar then forget about it right so i would say like you know have um some vision for the book and choose the editor based on you know your discussions about like what their vision is for the book as well um third is um you know about um writing right like so unless uh, i mean unless you have read other very good books on topics like these or just like very good writing um you know don't um like the the aim is not really to showcase your writing skills the aim is to um communicate what your idea is in the best and clearest possible manner to your readers yeah we yeah. are mostly talking about you know commercial non fiction right now so yeah so the the clarity is very important so focus on the clarity rather than um, you know trying to like showcase your writing skills um and yeah the the other thing would be about the marketing aspect of the book right so so there is so so once you finish the book um uh, and from the time from the from that time to the time it's published it's at least a few months if not more uh, so that gives you some time you know to think about uh, and execute your marketing strategy for the book so you know that is so use that time very well because if you if you were doing the book full time or let's say if you were doing the book alongside a regular job that won't leave you a lot of time to think about post um uh, release right like so uh, because the, the, it, like the book will just take up so much of your time just like writing the book or thinking about it or researching the book yeah, will yeah, just yeah. take so much of the time that you won't have a lot of time left to think about marketing while you're working on the book so use the time uh that you have in that lag till the book is published to really uh come out with some sort of a coherent marketing strategy uh, but honestly you know after the first 2 3 months or after the few months uh, it all depends on word of mouth like you can um, like even if you spend 
you know, whatever marketing money on the book, unless the people who have read the book. So what marketing does is a it creates awareness about the book, that basic awareness that yeah. you know such and such book is out there. If you're interested, uh, pick it up. This is this is what the book is about. So you can do. Uh, so what you can do is you can craft um, an appealing uh, marketing message about the book uh, uh, and all that. But eventually, the people who actually buy the book, A, are going to have to read the book. So you have to ensure that it gets to like the serious book readers in the first place or the people who are seriously interested in the topic that you're writing on in the first place. And that is where marketing obviously comes. Uh, that is where marketing is essential. So that is what marketing can do. But no matter how much you promote the book, unless the people who have read the book recommend it to their friends, to their colleagues, to their relatives, etc., it's not going to do well. Because honestly, you know, books is not like um, uh, a lot of other products. Because a book is actually something which a lot of people who have read the book have to recommend to others. Uh, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah. so marketing can only do so much. Like the book has to be like good uh, in a basic Readable, way yeah, uh, yeah. to yeah to and um, do well. So, um, what I understand here is, I think for your marketing wise, I think what worked was that you were able to get these good reviews uh, coming in, right? But uh, if let's say uh, somebody has to really let's say work on the marketing of the book. Uh, which are like, uh, let's say, three areas that you focus on? Should it be uh, getting it reviewed by people? Should it be, let's say, doing more of podcasts these days? Or should it be uh, doing some launch event around it? Like what is like two, three uh, critical sort of tick, uh, critical areas that somebody should focus on to get traction immediately? So it's a mix of all these things, right? Um, it also okay. depends, honestly, like it depends on the kind of book that it is. Um, so mm -hmm. for um, a lot of serious books, uh, for all serious books, in fact, you definitely need a lot of um, newspaper coverage uh, because um, like serious readers, you know, tend to um, read a lot of reviews uh, of the book before they buy or yeah. before they choose to read. So for serious books, you need um, newspaper coverage. And you need the book to be reviewed. Uh, for, let's say, uh, more commercial books, you know, reviews will be helpful, but I don't know if they are essential. Um, so like a lot of, um, uh, let's say, startup books, right? Like how to do this or how to do that. They may not necessarily need reviewers. Over there is where social media and the newer channels uh, of marketing are really important. So, you know, stuff like Instagram, um, podcast, LinkedIn, those are extremely important uh, for more Got commercial it. books. Uh, so, uh, Mehir, I think given uh, you, you had been doing research on Flipkart so heavily for so many years, and then you spoke to so many people within the process of writing the book, uh, I mean, would you be able to share a few stories which uh, I think you were like surprised to know about Flipkart? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, the the way it ended, right? Like the way the Flipkart um, story ended, like the, the way the sale happened was just incredible. I mean, you know, it it is just very very tough to believe that like such a big historic sale can happen in this way um so for instance like the way uh the the, the negotiations were conducted at the end um what went down between sachin and Bini. i mean i was like i knew some of these details because i had reported on it uh when they happened but honestly i had i had very little idea about the the details right so um you know yeah so i mean for instance when um uh, so this is the last leg of the negotiations between flipkart and walmart um and you know the flipkart team is in bentonville and sachin had been leading the negotiations uh from flipkart side along with leaf itself um so 
um, you know, so he he sprang a surprise as such on uh, the Flipkart team uh, because he asked for rights to name the CEOs of Flipkart, Mintra, and PhonePay, and um, you know, uh, some some leaders at Flipkart uh, were opposed to it. Um, and then Sachin just made this into a non-negotiable thing, and it the it 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 was so dramatic that the sale was almost called off because of this. You know, so oh. the, so yeah, so like the the negotiations had been going on for what like seven eight months by that point. Um, it had been like extensively reported in the media, and it could have just all gone to waste. Because of this, um, you know, and then Flipkart would have had to raise capital again, and you know, would have had to, yeah, like it would have, it would have not been good for them. Um, so th- this is what it, yeah, it, it is what it came down to, and it actually, um, um, uh, you know, so the Flipkart board had a decision to make uh, whether to keep Sachin or to not keep Sachin, and that again is just, you know, such. A pretty shocking thing at least at that time um, um and it it came to Bini to actually deliver the message to sachin um and uh, it was so dramatic that you know Bini by that point had actually kind of indicated to the board that he did not want to be involved with Sipkart in a in a very very uh, direct or a heavy way um so he was pretty much um uh, gonna be uh, involved with Sipkart in a non operational capacity after the sale if not immediately, okay. then definitely a few months after that. And okay. now, you know, at the last moment, he was kind of like, he was asked to change his mind. Um, and he had to deliver the message to Sachin that, you know, Sachin services, like Sachin services would no longer be required at Flipkart. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, someone who was very directly involved um, in this process, um, you know, just describe how it went down. And, you know, they said that Bini was actually shaking just before he had to tell Sachin. Um, so it's details like these, you know, that just kind of were very, very surprising um, yeah, to yeah. learn even for me. Even though, And this is like, you know, I mean, after four years of work, of, of reporting on Flipkart, um, so many stories even done by others on the sale itself, on... Um, you know, the last leg of the negotiations. I mean, very few people even had an inkling about details like these. Um, yeah, so it, like, I mean, every, almost every other interview that I did, uh, you know, threw up details like, like this. Um, yeah. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. So, Mehir, uh, maybe I think taking a few steps back and, uh, also wanted to understand where did you grow up how was your uh growing up years did you also always wanted to be a journalist uh why this career option you can probably talk a little bit about it and would you recommend people to uh become a journalist uh, follow follow this pursue this industry or not and and then your views on uh how this industry is evolving i think we see that there is a transition happening with the digital media coming in so if you can probably uh, talk about these yeah. four or five. I've, I've thrown all the questions all, all at the same time to you. Right, right, right. So, yeah, so I, I grew up in Bombay. Um, okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, grew up in Bombay. I, uh, I moved to Bangalore only after, uh, my college years and, um, I've been working in Bangalore pretty much all of my professional life. Uh, I was actually, um, studying to become a chartered accountant. I passed the entrance exam and okay. while I was studying for, yeah, while I was studying for the second, um, uh, round, uh, you know, I just decided it wasn't for me. Honestly, okay. I, I just couldn't, um, um, conceive of me doing that for like five, six, seven years. Right. Because okay. I mean, after that you have to do, uh, your articleship and then there's the, the final uh, exam. Yeah, so it just seemed seem just way too much of a slog. Um, and then something that didn't really excite me. So I just decided to, um, uh, like not pursue it. Um, and yeah, I just, I think it was after my graduation um, that I decided that, you know, I wanted to become a journalist. Um, okay. But at least I was like more serious about it then. 
uh, after my graduation and i enrolled into a journalism college um, and yeah after that um, uh, i was hired uh, by cnbc we my batch actually uh, graduated um, in 2008 um, okay few months before the the great recession um, and that was actually the, the the peak of the media boom um, in india yeah. right like it was okay. everyone was hiring uh, salaries had kind of uh, <laughs> come up to a to a decent to a um, you know living wage uh, level um, okay. so yeah so that was a, a, a great time to enter journalism but then just like 5 months later you know the recession happened and everyone started cutting back so that that was that was a really really interesting um a period to to start business journalism in particular uh yeah yeah and then um i uh, i started um uh, like i was working at reuters where i was writing on american companies but then Uh, I joined Mint uh, and I started covering consumer companies uh, initially consumer and liquor companies and then in 2014 like I mentioned I started writing on startups. Um, yeah yeah. Yeah I think it was I think for the most part like I I've been a journalist now for about 15 years or so. Uh, for the most part it was it was a fairly rewarding um it's it's been a fairly rewarding profession um, because uh, you know you you get to um if you obviously get to meet a lot of interesting people uh, a, a lot a lot a lot of smart people um and you also get to write on things um which are really um uh you know helping shape uh, our understanding of the world so that that is a very very exciting thing um i think uh, over the past few years i mean you know i mean a lot of people know this um the 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 freedom and the scope for independent journalism has definitely reduced dramatically in mainstream media um because of you know the government um so so yeah so i think increasingly uh, i think after 2016 in particular you know i started seeing that the scope for independent journalism is reducing although i think in business journalism um it's still more than what it was Uh, it it is still more than what it is in other uh, spheres like political journalism um but that is also because business journalism in india has tended to be um not very critical um uh, you know for the most part so i think yeah, yeah so while uh, there is still uh, room for uh, independent and critical journalism uh, in business in india um it i think it is not at the level where it should be um so yeah so i think uh, but still having said that you know i i still think journalism is a pretty rewarding profession god cause of these yeah. things very very interesting how you move from ca to journalism and uh, we both graduated i think same year 2008 i also graduated so we got good jobs and oh. very few after <laughs> just a few months people were struggling to get a job so we have been lucky yeah there. i mean i i don't know how how did it work with you like in your field as well were there a lot of cuts uh, during the recession Haso. So 2008 is when I graduated from Roorkee and uh, of course I think 2008 got very good placements uh, the top company which uh, comes to our batch is Shlum so they hired about 50 guys and the year before they had hired four so ours was a very good placement but the very next year and I was interviewing my friend who was a five year degree from IIT Roorkee he was struggling to get a job so he just wow just uh, like really really worked very hard to land up in whatever job he can So yeah, yeah, it was very very difficult across across the country. I think for any anybody to get a job in two thousand nine, it was uh, it was yeah yeah yeah. So uh, also I was think I was also asking in in the, in the form of journalism. So do you think uh, uh, the shape uh, of journalism? I think the way we do the medium of journalism will change. Uh, let's say the hmm. traditional media is more newspaper advertising based uh, physical form uh, how do you think the shift is happening is it going somewhere like what we see happening in the us which is more subscription based and less ad based or how is the business journalism sort of uh, changing its shape and form now 
Yeah. So in India, I mean, so, you know, you mentioned the US. Uh, so in the US, um, uh, print media had a very, very trying and terrible experience um, until the last few years because the impact of the internet was far greater on print media in the US than it has been in India. Uh, okay. In India, you know, most of the large newspapers have actually managed to like survive uh, the internet era uh, or survive in the internet era. Um, whereas in the US, you know, there were, there were so many newspapers that shut down. Even the biggest papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, you know, there were question marks about their survival um, until 2016. I mean, it is only after the Trump era that, you know, they, they have seen a huge increase again in um, uh, subscriptions, right? So the, the the impact of the internet in the, in the US was far, far bigger than it has been in India. In India, for whatever reason, you know, newspapers haven't been that badly hit. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, they haven't struggled. Of course, they have struggled. But uh, they've still managed to get by, more or less, um, in this, in uh, over the last, like, 10 years or so. Um, but now, you know, they've been much, much slower compared with their peers in the West to actually um, uh, move to, the, to a subscription-based model because in India, it has mostly been ad-driven. Right. And I mean, in India, you know, um, like the, the price that you pay for newspapers is actually um, less than what uh, you get uh, yeah. for like your Raddi, right? So um, yeah, I mean, yeah. that was like one of the selling points of newspapers. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that is, that is, um, you know, that is good and bad. It's, it's, it's bad because people are not used to paying for news. Um, like lots of people, you know, don't want to pay for news. Um, so that um, um, that habit of paying a decent amount for news is not really widely, uh, has not been widely cultivated in India. Um, it's good because, you know, um, I mean, it gives you a chance to just start fresh um, uh, on the digital side. But, I mean, honestly, I don't think anyone has been able to figure this out in India yet. You know, like how okay. to move from an ad based to a more subscription based model. Like okay. Everyone is trying, um, but it's, it's very difficult to see um, this working for a lot of people. I mean, I think eventually you'll see like far fewer players um, when things become more and more digital. I mean, the, the shift to digital hasn't been as steep in India as it is in the US. Um, okay. So I think in India, people still like to read newspapers, um, especially the the middle aged and the older folks. You know, they still li like to read newspapers. Uh, they don't want everything online. So I think, yeah. So I think it makes that makes it easier in a way for media houses to. Um, to this, to this new day of... Um, got it, got it. So coming to the end of the podcast, Mehir, I have a few rapid fire questions, quick questions. So I think number one in my list is, what do you think made Flipkart so successful? I think it was their ambition and their understanding of how uh, the internet business worked. Because I think a lot of people in India uh, until Shipkart, you know, didn't really like they, they still try, they, they, they try to run internet businesses, but in an offline, from an offline mindset. So I think Shipkart just like they were extremely smart, like the Bunsen were extremely smart in understanding how internet businesses work, how scale work, how it's far more important to focus on scale than on margins initially um, and things like that. So I think their the mindset and their understanding that internet businesses need to be run in a different way than offline business. I think that was very, very easy. Got it. Got it. And at which you company... Can, you know, you can talk about things like their focus on customer service, um, their experience at Amazon and the, the culture that they cultivate. Of course, all those things are important. But yeah, yeah. the fundamental thing was that, you know, they understood that internet businesses, you cannot run internet businesses from an offline mindset. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. And which which company do you think is the Flipkart of today? 
Um, I think from a customer perspective, um, or at least in terms of um, uh, creating an organization that is geared towards offering excellent customer service, I think hands down Swiggy is you know the leader there. I mean, they like Swiggy is by far uh, the best customer service provider. Um, you know, their focus on delivering the best customer service on uh, on creating like very very well designed products. I think they are easily um the most um like they have carried forward flipkart uh flipkart's legacy in a way that no other startup has. yeah 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 that's amazing and i think you while you've written yours but what would be your top three book recommendations Mir? yeah i think in from in business books i mean these days i mostly read uh you know uh history uh, and political history but i think in business books uh for India, I think I would, or at least that are relevant to like the startup scene or to business in India. I would say that one, um, you know, everyone should read this book called Ambani and Sons uh, by uh, uh, this uh, Austra- former Australian journalist called Hamish McDonald. It's okay. it's it's a fantastic biography of uh, Dhirubhai Ambani. It's actually okay. a very very it's a very serious book. It's not a hey geography. It's it's just superbly done. So I would highly, highly recommend that book. Then I think um, for a survey of the Indian economy, our post independence, uh, there's this book by T. N. Nainan. Uh, I think it's I, I don't remember the full name. I think it's called the Turn of the Tortoise. Um, okay. Um, so I think I would recommend that. And third, um, you know, for uh, people. Uh, who want um like who want to generally understand how startups work um i think the everything store by brad stone is is a is a super yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah book yeah 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 great thank you so much Mihir, for uh, joining me on the podcast today it has been super exciting discussion lot of i i think knowledge when it comes to anybody who wants to write a book i think they should find all the nuggets of wisdom here so thank you so much for sharing all of us all of that with all of us so thanks again yeah thanks thanks for having me